stuttery video. Robots. More pig masks. Welcome to the resistance. Crushingly poor performance issues. Hipsters. Baristas. Critically acclaimed voice artists. Oh my god. You have got tattoos of him all over your body and he's just chucked you. Gig jobs. Self-driving cars. Cancel culture. Welcome to Watch Dogs Legion. It's an insurgency simulator where you organize an uprising for lols. Trigger warning. This review contains some very bad quality footage because the game ran like arse at launch. I decided to leave the footage in the review because editing it out would technically result in me censoring Ubisoft's failures. Another year, another Ubisoft game with pig masks, microtransactions, busy work, making vaguely misguided political statements set in an open world of hipsters, baristas and annoying stereotypes. Who would have thunk it? Yes, Watch Dogs Legion is a video game sequel from Ubisoft Toronto, set in a post-Brexit London, overrun with fascist rent-a-cops and incredibly garish outfits. Technically this is Watch Dogs 3, the third outing in the well-intentioned, interesting but never quite successful series of hacking and smashing simulators. The first game came out in 2016 and now here we are experiencing the third attempt to popularise this IP. As a general rule, Watch Dogs is typically described as an interesting idea that doesn't quite hit the mark. I think that describes Watch Dogs Legion fairly well, although I would note that whilst this game does not hit the mark, there really are some interesting game concepts at play here, and some of the aspects of the game are actually quite well done. So what precisely is Watch Dogs Legion? In a nutshell, and this might come as an incredible shock to anyone familiar with Ubisoft games, Legion is an open world third person adventure game where you run around completing doing work, collecting stuff and progressing along a main questline where you get to overthrow the evil fascists that have taken over London. You travel around on foot, by vehicle but mostly by drone because you are lazy and flying in a straight line means you don't have to navigate or steer. You can swap between any of the characters that you recruit and you can recruit virtually anyone in the game during your personal quest, line, to take on Albion, the private security firm that has taken over policing in London, which is deliberately named to invoke visions of British nationalism and racism in a paper thin attempt to be subtle and edgy. You get to choose which agent you play as, from a selection of hipsters, idiots, baristas, activists, SJWs, cosplayers and sex offenders. I was going to say that the roster was based on a typical selection of employees from your average Ubisoft studio, only I couldn't find enough stoners, sexual abuse victims or a character whose special power was does double damage when choking women in bars. Oh yeah. And there was only one sexual predator. You do main missions to turn the London boroughs defiant. You do side missions for reasons you have gig jobs. No, I really am not kidding. You do gig jobs for money in game. You collect stuff, you get bored, the game bugs out. It's a Ubisoft game. What more can I say? Basically, Watch Dogs Legion tries to immerse the player into an open world atmosphere of crypto fascism, whilst conveniently forgetting that traditionally history's most notable fascists 
have all been national socialists, or some such. The game makes the player feel like they are covertly operating in a surveillance state. It tries to create an atmosphere of oppression, tension, where your every move is being watched and you have to operate in the shadows for fear of being detected. Well, that was the plan apparently. The reality, however, is that you fly around wearing a high visibility jacket in broad fucking daylight, doing crimes in plain sight of everyone, whilst driving your car down the pavement for miles on end, where the biggest consequence might be a police officer grumbling and chasing you for five minutes. Or even less if you pop your cloaking device and hide in a bush. So yeah, the oppressive atmosphere thing, they didn't manage to pull that shit off. Unless of course you think not being able to play pavement skittles all day long without interruption qualifies as oppression. Ultimately, there is no escaping the fact that Watch Dogs Legion is basically a terrorism simulator. Now you could argue that the bad guys are evil, therefore you're not really a terrorist, you're a freedom fighter, but this quite obviously feeds directly into the cliché that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. I mean, every terrorist thinks they're the good guy, right? That is basically a core concept of insurgency politics. The other guys are baddies, we are goodies. Therefore, if we do mean stuff, it's okay because we're doing it to the bad people. It's a central tenet of dehumanising your enemy. For thousands of years, humans have been deploying the same logic to justify committing atrocities. So rightly or wrongly, culturally relative or not, in Watch Dogs Legion, you go around committing terrorist acts, because you have decided that the baddies need to be ousted from power. You manipulate people into supporting you, commit acts of sabotage, kill rando security guards and basically get handed a giant array of lethal weapons and the ability to drop giant fucking bombs on people's heads. And then Ubisoft also gives you a couple of taser weapons so they can put their hands in the air and say, it's not our fault officer, we gave them non-lethal weapons. It's the player's fault that they're killing people and doing terrorism stuff in our game. So yeah, don't let that point slip by you. Watch Dogs Legion is a self-conscious terrorism simulator where hipsters, baristas, misfits and stereotypes loll around doing terrorism because it's hilarious apparently. Because it's all a giant lol and it's okay to kill fascists because your enemy is bad people. Might as well have just called this game Watch Dogs Antifa. Obviously the biggest single irony of this game however is this you can't go looting. Hilarious that really, Ubisoft created an insurgency and terrorism simulator where your main goal is to cause mayhem, stir social unrest and trigger an uprising. And the only thing in the game that is 100% locked down and secure that you can't mess with is the in-game purchases and microtransactions. That shit, that shit right there, you always have to pay for. Hilarious. Some people might argue, what's the point of having an uprising if you can't go and steal some new clothes and raid the shops? I wouldn't say that, obviously. But some people certainly seem to think it's the case. All this being said, obviously the huge scope of the violence, destruction and human suffering the game enables the player to inflict on the people of London is quite good fun for a while. Dropping a two ton crate of explosive materials on someone's head from a fucking drone will never get old. Well, actually it does. The violence in this game is admittedly entertaining, but it is not enough on its own to sustain the enjoyment. So let's discuss the functionality and fuckery. I mean, where do I even start when trying to describe the abysmal state of this game at launch? I know, I will read some headlines I found when googling the game. Watch Dogs Legion releases with grotesque performance issues and single player microtransactions. Happy Gamer. Watch Dogs Legion runs like a pig crap. Bad frame rate. Joker Productions. Watch Dogs Legion benchmarked. Seriously demanding. Tom's Hardware. 
Strangely, there's absolutely jack shit about it on the Watchdog subreddit. Then again, Ubisoft isn't even pretending it's not running the subreddits anymore. Not even kidding. The keybinding and configuration is a masterclass of poor organisation. It reminded me of the godawful setup in Ghost Recon Breakpoint, a game where you literally had the entire keyboard mapped to something because of piss poor organisation. As soon as I tried to rebind my keys, I thought, here we go again. I'll spend the first three hours constantly escaping out to a menu to try and rebind shit that isn't set up properly. And I was not disappointed. Every time they found something to do in this game, they stuck that thing on a list that required a button. Then they just kept adding to that list until you had nine pages of fucking button assignments. Dear fucking lord, someone needs to come along before the game is released and actually organise this stuff. It's great you can literally customise everything individually, but that should be an option, not a requirement. If people like a certain movement setup and a certain button to reload, that shit should be automatically normalised across the entire game when you change the default. If someone wants to go in and change individual stuff later, then whoopty fucking do. But shit on a stick, making us do this manually just means that for any player who does not use default settings, they just inserted an hour of fuckery between installing and enjoying the game. Well, they actually inserted lots of other obstacles to enjoying this game. But more of this later. I mean, why do I have one interact key, another key to interact with a door lock, and another key to interact with a fucking camera? Think this through, for fuck's sake, because that 10 minutes of laziness results in many hours of annoyance for the players. I would note that my key setup tended to evolve over time and get more fine-tuned as I gradually rebound the monstrous complexity of buttons until it became more manageable. I'm not going to lie though, even at its best, it felt like the control schemes from five different games all mashed into one game experience. As I develop more sophisticated combined arms tactics, approaching on cargo drone, deploying spider bots and combat spider bots and going in guns blazing, whilst using my combat spider bot to stop flanking attacks, it did at times feel like utter headfuck, constantly flipping between the different control schemes. Then again, perhaps this is what the game is best at. It's a puzzle game, where it's constantly messing with your mind as you fumble through the baffling control schemes. So yeah, it's probably very good for brain plasticity in the long run, but in the short term, it often made me feel like it was just melting my brain like burned plastic. Oh yeah, and some of the in-game tutorials give you advice based on the default settings and not the rebound key assignments. So yeah, that didn't make much sense either. I did eventually manage to organise a vaguely less annoying key setup and then Ubisoft patched the game and overwrote my keybind save file, which is best characterised as shoddy. The ugly spectre of monetization raised its ugly head as usual for a Ubisoft title. Dear Lord, once again the dirty bastards in Paris are peddling their little pixelated coins to the players, who incidentally just bought the game for real money. But that's not enough. They also want to sell us pseudo money in game. For real cash. Assholes. Personally, I played this on Game Pass by the way. £15 for one month is admittedly a scam, but a less painful scam than buying this game for full price. Just saying. I also experienced multiple issues with recruiting dialogue, mission dialogue, quests updating and showing on the map, and generally what could be most adequately described and best filed under The Game Is Broke. It was tiresome speaking to people who weren't interested, then getting a quest, then not getting a marker on the map, then getting one when you got closer to the location, which you could guess from hitting show on the map before it even showed up, which would put you in the approximate ballpark and then sometimes the post-completion dialogue would be mistimed or completely wrong. At launch, this game was a fuck farm and all the bugs were invited along for a roll in the mud. The game clearly wasn't finished and polished at launch. I'm not saying it's a beta build, but hell, the entirely weird load screens, cut video, drops to black, pauses, overlaps between interactions and screen noise all make it look like it's a cobbled together slightly unfinished mess. 
I mean, why the fuck does the combat tutorial drop to black between bouts? Why did interacting with the button cut off the voice? I'll tell you why. Because these were built as modular components and they were loaded up individually one at a time because it was patched together with duct tape and panic sweat at the last minute. Talking of optimization, running this game on an above average video card, the graphics ran like shit and I had to turn everything down, turn off ray tracing or my high speed rampages would result in stutter and lock up. There is no escaping the fact that this game ran like a fucked cat on launch day. I mean, even the game is telling me that I'm running it at settings that barely tax my PC. At one point, I dropped the frame rate to 30 FPS and it produced zero change in the stuttering and freezing. Apparently, it's appalling on console too. Needless to say, Ubisoft are trying to put together patches and bullshit statements trying to claim that the game is fine or it could be something with the way your rig is set up. Well, it would certainly appear that every single PC and console owner that bought Watch Dogs Legion clearly have something wrong with their collective rigs. Every last damn one of them. The game's performance slightly improved over the first week, which I assume is patches, but I would note that just like The Division 2, the longer you play this game, the more artefacts start appearing and eventually you just have to shut it down and start again. So yeah, it's just another typical Ubisoft launch then. So what about the basic gameplay? First impressions is that it's quite a jaunty little adventure. The open world London is a giant, active, vaguely underpopulated playpen. You have gadgets, skills, missions, sneaking around busy work and you set to work trying to uncover a devious plot which was hatched to disempower the core blimey governor London stereotypes. Instead of character development as such you kind of have team character development. Well you get to constantly switch between different unlikable characters and develop and acquire new skills and hacks. There are frequently a multitude of ways to complete the same mission, ranging from run and gun to sophisticated traps and distractions. Being able to acquire and use increasing amounts of tools just eggs the pudding really. You can also recruit people to your cause that bring faction wide bonuses like extra damage output. I actually found this aspect interesting and motivated me for a while at least to do a little spree of recruiting around the city. If you get injured or taken out, that character becomes temporarily or permanently unavailable. The much discussed cargo drone is, I guess, over useful, but I don't really think it's overpowered. For some missions, the AK-47 is overpowered. For other missions, the combat spider drone is overpowered. For farming tech points and getting to difficult places, the cargo drone is technically a bit overpowered, I guess. But which tech and which team member is technically OP can be very context specific. But I would agree with the general consensus that, if in doubt, get the cargo drone out. A core activity of the game is infiltrating enemy or hostile locations. You can employ a variety of tactics for this, choosing anything along a scale between total stealth through non-lethal force all the way up to total balls out full scale military frontal assault. The typical hostile location usually comprises of a compound or building generally populated by hostile guards, cameras, security traps, alarms, the ability to call in reinforcements, security and attack drones, parked vehicles, locked doors, electronic power points that you can trigger as traps and some item, device or information that you have to sabotage, steal or hack. Or some combination or variation of all of the above. As you advance through the game, the locations get progressively more complex, more difficult and heavily defended. Assuming you don't just face plant through the front door, all guns or tasers blazing, the covert infiltration is a test of wits and puzzle solving abilities. By hacking an exterior or nearby camera, you can then jump from camera to camera reconnoitering the facility and jumping to and from the cameras to other devices. You can arm lethal or non-lethal traps if you can get line of sight on them and when you have acquired the appropriate skills you can jump from camera to hostile security drones 
take control and fly them around, or use their weapons against the enemies. You can distract guards, electrocute them with their own equipment, zap them with their own drones and deactivate their security, or just murder every last one of them, because it's funny. Combine this with your growing arsenal of equipment like drones, spider bots, lethal and non-lethal weaponry and ranged hacking and your options for infiltration become unlimited. Generally however, I found they fell into three rough approaches. Complete stealth. I would hack in, negotiate my way electronically to the target, achieve my mission goal and be gone unnoticed. Stealth assault. I would employ stealth and guile to neutralise the facility and any defenders, then walk in the front door unopposed, loot everything and complete my mission. And lastly, carnage. I would walk through the front door with either a weapon or a non-lethal weapon and use brute force to neutralise the facility's personnel. Although if I'm honest, even when I did this with non-lethal taser weapons, somebody usually ended up getting blown up or killed by accident. But you know, according to Ubisoft, terrorism's a big lol anyway, so who fucking cares? Since your most significant player improvements come from collecting resources and achieving goals, not from any direct XP mechanism, there is zero incentive for murdering or zapping everyone to grind up XP, and seemingly a few reasons to avoid causing undue chaos and harm. I'm not going to lie, depending on how you approach it, this aspect of the game is both mentally challenging, a worthy puzzle format and generally a very enjoyable brain teaser. Unless of course your approach is murdering everyone on sight. Sure, it did eventually become a little formulaic and perhaps a tiny bit tired after the 20th or 30th time, but I would note that this approach to mission completion was a breath of fresh air, flexed the brain muscles and is probably the major selling point of the game if you're looking for something different and slightly more cerebral than running around shooting people all the time in your video games. Then of course, if you do want to be a complete douchebag, you can just fly around on your drone, drop heavy containers on people's noggins, smooshing them into paste until they call reinforcements and then pulp those fuckers too. Then drop yourself off on the roof, pull out your AK and get to work, making sure the orphanages have a busy Christmas this year. But you know, you can't have a terrorist uprising without smashing a few skulls according to Ubisoft at least. So what's my analysis of Watch Dogs Legion? Well, I couldn't find any trademark Nazi guns or memorabilia in the game, so that puts it a head and shoulders above any title from Ubisoft Massive. When Massive does finally release Avatar, I fully expect the Smurfs to be armed with MP40s and wearing Stahlhelms. Just saying. This noteworthy and actually serious point aside, I actually like the whole false flag attack corporate conspiracy premise. Sure, it's a bit tired and overused in dystopian sci-fi, but I like it. Probably because I'm familiar with it. Because it happens all the damn time in movies, games and comics. I would also note that there were some very good intentions and rather interesting ideas going on in the game. The whole underground theme was good, you know, the notion that it's all candy floss and fucking roses on the surface, but underneath the streets there are activists trying to combat what is, effectively, a corporate military coup. The swearing and general language was frankly relaxing. Many of the Londoners in the game could barely let a sentence leave their mouths without at least one bollock or fuck squeezing out of their pie holes too. The graffiti was also splendid, far nicer than a lot of the shite you usually see around town and definitely inspired more by Banksy than Millwall Public Toilets. This is not a game without merit. If you really like the microcosm they created here and just being in the world, soaking up the dystopian vibes, well they did good work. The beer keg modelling was on point and I thought a lot of the takeaway boxes and styrofoam containers were beautifully modelled in all their greasy, mildly toxic glory. I really liked the way you could dip into media news commentaries delivered as radio shows or podcasts, some of which were very well done and had an authentic feel. 
It was just a shame I couldn't find a way to activate them and listen to them whilst I was doing other stuff. I mean, they were good, but not good enough for me to stop playing for five minutes in order to listen to some random asshole go through some exposition. I couldn't help entertain the suspicion that this was deliberate and designed to pad out the game. In fact, this created a huge problem for my experience of Legion. I was forced to choose between stopping and listening to the audio or skipping it and missing a huge chunk of the game's backstory. When I tried to force myself to listen to all the audio recordings, I started to feel like I was playing some kind of point and click detective game. There is no escaping the fact that this game has quite impressive scope. It's a fairly large part of central London, realised as an active, interactive sandbox for mayhem, wanton carnage, terrorism and casual cruelty to random members of the public. Apparently most of the NPCs can be recruited eventually, and I at least got to the point where I started running into people I knew. It's basically a giant open world insurgency simulator, and on a technical level this is quite an admirable ambition. It's just a shame that in this particular open world they have decided to portray London as a city of grumbling closed minded shitheads desperately in need of hipster misfits and cosplayers to save us from our own ignorance and bigotry. It's basically the hipster antifa woke equivalent of white saviour syndrome. It's vaguely offensive, arrogant and patronising all at the same time. The safe house environment was really creatively done and full of eye candy, but I ain't gonna lie when I realised that this was yet another Ubisoft game with safe house mechanics, I sighed, groaned and let out a little ironic laugh. And anyone claiming your actions have consequences might be taking the piss a little bit. I pointedly ran everyone over for hours, no fucks given, no consequences faced. Considering London is practically under martial law, it seems a bit weird that you can carjack and demolition derby all over town with complete impunity. There's also the vaguely awkward issue of the general vocabulary used by locals and random NPCs, which is on a par with some of my videos. Ubisoft appears to have recklessly assumed that nearly everyone in London is a foul-mouthed rude fuck that can't seem to open their breathing holes without telling someone to go and fuck themselves or eat a bag of dicks. This assumption is obviously correct. I felt right at home. There are a few expletives however which are a bit off. You know, like when someone from a foreign country tries to do an impression of a Londoner. Tiddle my bollocks, said nobody ever. On one front I like the casual profanity that I hear every day as a Londoner, on another front people don't shout that crap at each other in the street. You see, in countries with no guns or legal self-defence weapon ownership, the populace has a tendency to resort to other means of settlement dispute and conflict resolution. In the UK, for example, this is almost exclusively confined to punching and kicking. Therefore, we might swear at our friends, like they're our enemies but we are usually quite polite to random strangers in the street for one impeccably logical reason. They might turn around and start hitting us very fucking hard in the head. Despite the perception of the UK as a super peaceful place where it's utterly lovely, the cops don't carry guns and there is virtually no crime and we all have fucking tea and biscuits with the Queen on Tuesdays, the reality is somewhat different. Our cops do carry guns, just not the regular street constables. We are also a world leader in criminal violence, outstripping New York a few years ago in murders. And incidentally, nobody, and I mean not one Londoner I have ever met, has been round to Bucky Palace to have tea with the Queen. Firstly, because normal people don't get invited, and secondly, normal people probably wouldn't want to go mainly because her biscuits are probably something shitty, like rich tea, and almost certainly a bit stale, like her. And she probably smells a little bit of piss and death. On the plus side though, if you do get inside Buckingham Palace, I bet the booze cabinet is awesome and there's probably some decent drugs cashed away behind every pillar and cupboard. I mean, Prince Andrew used to be a regular at Buckingham Palace, 
until the Queen found out that he was also a regular at Epstein's sex parties. So there is that. The modelling of London was creepily effective, and although most of central London is a giant maze of rat runs and confusing one-way systems, even a functionally defective navigator like myself kept finding myself recognising roads and routes and catching my bearings. It is a compressed, stylized miniaturisation of central London at about one-third scale. The best way to describe it is that it's like someone tried to faithfully reproduce London, where two out of three buildings were missing. Loads of the key recognisable locations are present, but lots of in-between buildings, roads and pathways are missing. I'm not going to lie though, it was pretty well done, and slightly spooky at times, especially when I found myself driving down the road and thinking, ah, I need to take a right turn down here. It was also spooky when I tried to find places I knew, and they weren't there. When this happened, it suddenly felt a bit like one of those alien simulations in movies, you know, where the protagonists find themselves thinking, there's something not quite right going on here. There is no escaping the fact that whoever programmed the AI might in fact be an NPC themselves. The NPCs frequently behaved like they were lobotomized. Badly. So I guess in a strangely classical Judeo-Christian way, their creator modelled them on his own image. Perhaps a bit too faithfully. I would personally reckon Watch Dogs Legion AI is pitching somewhere between Ghost Recon Breakpoint and Far Cry 5. All the NPCs might not all come around the corner and take cover in the same spot, one at a time, yet nevertheless they will usually all come around the same corner, most of them will take the same cover, and even if they don't, they will probably do nearly the same as the previous 15 pilgrims walking into your ambush. The shady representation of moral and political issues is muddled and incomprehensible. I'm not convinced they know what point they were trying to really make, but yet somehow, they still managed to fuck it up. Ubisoft basically pulled its usual stunt. Whilst claiming to avoid being political, it ended up stomping through many issues in such a way that it made a fuck ton of political points regardless. They included a whole section about evil cockney people traffickers who used immigrant slave labour as cleaners and forced organ donors. I guess because they didn't want to offend anyone, so they decided to make the perpetrator a white working class Londoner. The contrary to popular perception, London isn't a particularly racist city. It's a city of immigrants like New York. As is frequently the case, racism tends to be worse in the parts of the country with the least immigration. Besides, in most examples where people traffickers have delivered their victims into slavery in the UK, it's an operation usually entirely confined to one national group. Think about it, to have the capacity to smuggle people into the country point to point and receive and enslave them here on arrival, you kinda need to have an operation that spans both countries. That's why usually the slaves are the same nationality as the enslavers, and the people smugglers that got them there. I'm not saying it doesn't happen in other ways, I'm just saying that if you're gonna cover human slavery in the UK, setting it in London and having a white working class Londoner in charge of it is probably the least likely scenario to choose. I mean, do you think the pearly king and queen decided to jog over to China, Estonia, Vietnam and North Africa to set up criminal organisations so they could get involved with people smuggling? I think they would make more money staying here and fencing stolen cars and selling knockoff cigarettes and booze. I think it speaks volumes about the crazy fucked up hyper real world we live in that this game has gig jobs within the game. I'm pretty sure that most people's lives are shitty enough without making them pay real cash money for a video game full of shitty microtransactions you have to pay for with real cash money, and then you make them do a gig job within the game, but you don't reward them with real cash money. Fuck. So yes, in this game you can do a side hustle where you deliver Amazon style parcels, the ones too dodgy to deliver by normal drone transport. 
And maybe they didn't even think this through well enough because the whole world is buzzing with drones, so surely they could design a special drone for your dodgy parcels. I mean, if they can't and everything dodgy has to be hand delivered, wouldn't it be really obvious that everyone carrying a physical parcel for delivery was a criminal? The characters in this game are special. I have rarely encountered a game with so many unlikable, unsympathetic and wooden characters. One or two stick out for particularly good voice work or script, but honestly this is not a game where you're likely to have a favourite character to play. You will undoubtedly be playing with the least annoying character with the most useful gadgets and skills. So yeah, it will probably be one of the construction workers. Ok, I admit it, the cargo drone is overpowered. It's actually strange that artistically this game seems to worship London, but ideologically it's simultaneously taking a giant shit on the city. It's as if the subversive subtext of the game was, London would be a great place if you could just get rid of the Londoners. Most of the background conversation seems to be people being angry, verbally abusive, ranting or some such, like the undercurrent of London is a seething cauldron of hatred just waiting to boil over. I also question the wisdom of the practically encouraged running down of civilians in the locations of the actual real ramming attacks in the city. This is a paper thin attempt to facilitate some kind of faux controversy where someone runs down a bunch of innocent people on London Bridge and then posts it on YouTube. Look, as anyone from London will know, we are a city that lives under the constant spectre of terrorism. For all of recent modern history, terrorists have been bombing us, stabbing us, running us over and shooting us. Terror attacks are something you just accept when you live here. So yeah, it's a bit fucking stupid to make a game which is essentially a terrorism and insurgency sandbox game and set it in London and give it a strong anti-Brexit theme. Whatever your views on Brexit, London has been under perpetual terror attacks for over half a century. So frankly, this renders the whole premise of this game strangely off kilter. This aside, you are recruiting from the same population that you are trying to win over, so there is somewhat of an incentive to use non-lethal force. I'm not sure how much of this is flavour and how much of this is real game mechanics, but I certainly opted for less lethal force as I advanced through the game. I got the ability to deep scan people and realised that a lot of people seem to hate my guts. No change there then. So for a short while at least, I tried to do slightly less wholesale murdering so that people liked me more. Another big problem with this game is that you don't really care how this is all going to end. All the games I've finished have been for three reasons. One, they were so addictive I couldn't put them down. Two, I was under duress. Three, I wanted to see how they ended. The problem with Legion is that I don't really feel invested in resolving the outcome. It reminded me of the second Division game, where after 10 hours of saving screeching whining cream puff hipsters and baristas in the sweaty city, you end up feeling less sympathetic about their plight and start sneakingly hope they do die. Or at the very least, learn to collect their own fucking water and screws. It's a story where everyone is potentially an annoying recruit to your insurgency. The enemy is evil fascist scum lord anti-immigration right wing racist fuckbags. But, and this is a big but, apparently every single last motherfucking NPC in this game is potentially recruitable if you can manipulate them. It's kind of hard to maintain this good will overcome evil narrative when the entire game is structured around the pretext of the enemy are scum, unless you can recruit them then they magically become your bestie. And that's the thing about insurgency and counterinsurgency, it's got nothing to do with good and evil and morality, who is right and who is wrong, it's just sides in a conflict. It's just a means to achieve power, just like the group Albion did at the start of the game. And let's face it, you as a player character are no better than Albion, because if you can manipulate people into joining your side, then they are now your friends. If not, 
They are expendable. Fuck. They're expendable either way. We are supposed to unquestionably position Albion as the villains of the story and our organisation DedSec as the heroes. They are bad because they facilitate and participate in hateful crimes and actions. We are good, even though we constantly engage in car chases, running down innocent pedestrians, dropping crates on people's heads and killing security guards. The moral dimension to the game doesn't really make sense. I personally committed vastly more carnage in one hour than Albion does in the whole damn game. But they're the bad guys. If Albion threw me in prison, the death rate for pedestrians certainly would plummet instantly and London would be, frankly, a lot safer. Just saying. I mentioned earlier how people bandy around the word fascist too easily but maybe that's the point of this game. Both sides are fascists in a sense. You just get to decide whether you continue to play long enough to replace one regime with another. You just get to pick which group of totalitarian unelected thugs run the show. I think this game suffers from what I can best describe as Death Stranding Syndrome. It's defective and suffers from huge flaws, but there are some seriously excellent concepts at play nevertheless. And just like Death Stranding, a lot of gamers will find the prospect of buying it very unappealing, and many players will find the experience very, very boring. But some players who find this game world and busy work satisfying and comforting will happily get lost in Legion for hundreds and hundreds of hours. Believe me, they will. If this game clicks with you, you will play it for months. Death Stranding was a game I could bitch and moan about for a whole hour, but nevertheless, I played it for several hundreds of hours. Legion is a fuck pie of a mess too, but some players are going to get seriously engrossed in the deeper levels of the gameplay mechanics, even if they don't result in much more than the satisfaction of knowing they exist and knowing that you utilise them correctly. A small subset of players are going to cap this game, then crank the difficulty and turn on permadeath and do the whole thing a second time, more masterfully and more subtly. After coming to this conclusion, I thought about it and realised it's an incredibly odd coincidence that both games are linked to and promoted using the rhetoric of the Brexit discourse. For now, I'm going to assume this is entirely coincidental, but it is noteworthy nevertheless. Unfortunately, however, once you find your groove with this game and start to build your own agenda and priority list, you can very quickly find yourself locked into a cycle of loading screens where you can't be bothered to drive, don't have the inclination to walk, it's too far to fly on your slow cargo drone, so you just fast travel via the very slow loading screens. Fast travel to speak to someone, then get given a mission, fast travel to the mission, do the mission, fast travel back to somewhere else, and every time I load into the subway station my game grinds its gears with an almost PC crushing processing load. They say that it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. The problem with Legion is that you don't really care that much about the destination and the journey isn't really compelling enough to keep trudging forward, for most gamers at least. I started losing the desire to play this game for the review at the point that I came to this precise conclusion. I don't care which side wins this war, they are equally reprehensible and using the precise same tactics, only with a different economy of scale and resources. As I did that, I quit out of the game and I had to wait for 1 minute and 8 seconds whilst Ubisoft uploaded my player information, microtransaction habits and whatever other personal information it was stealing from me only to find myself in the main menu where I had to quit out again, only to have my game crash and lock up so I had to Alt 4 to shut it down. I know this is a broken record at this point, but Ubisoft seems to execute their in-game microtransactions perfectly, steal your personal data perfectly and can't do anything else worth a fucking damn. I did come back to the game for a bit longer, but then stopped playing for reasons I will explain later. No discussion of Legion would be complete without at least discussing the politics of this game. 
I will nail my colours to the mast here. I actually love politics in video games. The core plot of Red Dead Redemption 2 was structured around modernity and the changing socio-economic structure of the Americas. Wonderful. Deus Ex was all about politics and politics of science and technology. Command and Conquer, Red Alert, which faction you chose in Rome Total War. Many video games not only include politics, they are organised upon political tectonic shifts and tensions. I have got no issue with politics in video games. I do, however, have an issue with stupidity in video games. I also have issues with games that preach to you, games with shit characters that exist for no other purpose than to push an agenda, weird and forced diversity in video games, people trying to push that diversity onto other people's video games. Basically I have an issue with people making games shit in order to push a specific political agenda. Muslim Massacre, the game of modern religious genocide, tried to push a political agenda at the expense of having a decent core game concept. And that was shit. Alpha Omega, the Christian RPG, tried to push religion at the expense of core gameplay, and let's just say it won't be competing with Skyrim anytime soon. The Last of Us 2 tried to push identity politics at the expense of the core player experience, and that ended up being… well, it ended up being a fucking meme. My point is, politics in video games is good. Politics at the expense of the video game is bad. And this is one of the reasons why Watch Dogs Legion is a defective game. The whole bullshit ideological narrative of Legion was written in crayon on finger paints, Good people hate immigration control. Bad people like immigration control. Brexit supporters are bad. Fascists are bad. Subversive kids are good. This is very similar to the narrative that racists voted for Brexit and Brexit won in the referendum because of angry, bitter, fascist, intolerant racists who don't like Johnny Foreigner. I would postulate that whatever the fuck happened during the Brexit referendum, it was probably slightly more nuanced than the thesis that bad people done it. Trying to unpack something as complicated as 50 years of Anglo-European relations, the EU and immigration policy is beyond the scope of this video. Fuck, nobody has really managed to do it yet at all. But for now, let's just say that this game tries to address hugely complicated and emotive issues with all the dexterity and sensitivity of someone trying to write a political essay whilst only using their face. People voted for and against Brexit for many, many reasons. Characterising the referendum as bad people voted to leave the EU and good people voted to remain is fucking moronic oversimplification. I also observed that the release of this game coincided with the US election. The Trump Brexit bifecta is a well known trope. I don't think for a second that the timing is accidental. It's bring a fascist to work day, by the way, according to one NPC in the game. Seriously, this is shit dialogue at its best. What chafes my gooch more than many aspects of today's moronic and uncontextualised political dialogue is the casual use of the word fascist. Strangely, this is done more often than not by people that seem vaguely fascist themselves. People seem to forget that the Nazis were national socialists and that fascism is more of a political doctrine than a descriptor of an individual person's actions. So yeah. In this regard at least, the game is about as politically nuanced as a screeching cream puff at an activist meeting. The notion of treating the boroughs like unique principalities was a bit ridiculous too. London is not fucking Afghanistan, so why treat the boroughs like they are unique power entities? Like you are recruiting tribal warlords in some third world failed state shithole? I'm not saying that London is better or more civilised than Afghanistan, and I will concede that a lot of London is indeed a shithole. I'm sure the average Afghan is probably far more pleasant and polite to random strangers than your average Londoner. I'm just saying that there is no logic behind treating discrete parts of London 
like they are consolidated power blocks. I shit you not, most of the time in London you don't have a fucking clue which borough you're in. You can walk a few miles and pass through four boroughs. You can live in one and commute through six others to get to work. We don't have tribal borough tattoos on our faces. But I guess since one of the political themes of the game is that Brits are a bunch of tribalistic xenophobes, I guess in someone's head at Ubisoft it made sense to organise an entire core game mechanic around the assumption that London is a tribal patchwork of feudal racist states and if you turn their allegiance to your own cause they will fight for you. It's fucking bizarre that this game is trying so hard to be woke but at the same time superimposes a really insulting quasi medieval borderline bigoted set of assumptions onto the city with a fundamental lack of first hand knowledge which is painful at times. As I keep bleating on about, London is a city of immigrants, not militias. I could not end the discussion of politics in Watch Dogs Legion without at least mentioning how Ubisoft is cancelling and censoring the voice artist, author and journalist Helen Lewis, who recorded some of the podcasts in the game apparently. It turns out that someone recognised her voice and started to complain. Although if I'm entirely honest, it is probably vastly more likely that someone at Ubisoft Toronto objected to her involvement with Watch Dogs Legion and ratted her out to the industry gatekeepers and those kind, tolerant folk on Reset Era, who rounded up an army of cream puffs to start screeching about it and get her cancelled. And for the record, I actually really am proposing this was most likely to be a deliberate leak from someone at Ubisoft Toronto. Look, most people don't know who Helen Lewis is. But this was Ubisoft Toronto. In Canada, most people go to university closest to where they live. Toronto University students will be oh so familiar with the controversies surrounding their most famous professor, Jordan Peterson and anyone intimately familiar with Peterson will have most likely seen his GQ interview with voice artist, author and journalist Helen Lewis. Any snowflakes working at Ubisoft Toronto would have lit up like fucking firework displays the second they saw her walk in the building or at the very least noticed her name on the voice artist roster. For reasons I will do my best to explain. I will try my best to summarise what this drama is about, however be warned, I'm mostly googling this shit and I am neither knowledgeable about feminism and politics. I'm not an expert on law, gender or identity politics and even though this might come as a terrible, terrible shock to you guys, I did not do a gender studies degree. So you know, I will do my best to muddle my way through this without offending everyone, which is impossible these days, but I'll try. In 2017 Helen Lewis wrote an article for the Times which was critical of the proposed new UK laws concerning gender. The key part of this law which many people took issue with was that people would be able to choose their own gender at will. And I'm talking, you know, just jog on down to the local council offices and tell them that you've changed your gender. Job done. No interview, no doctor, no solicitor, no third party involvement. Everyone just now decides. They can change it at will, do what they fucking like. I'll be seeing all of you guys in the ladies changing rooms later I guess. Helen Lewis criticised this move. Helen Lewis Left wing feminist, feminist author, women's rights activist, trans rights supporter, etc, etc, fucking etc, suddenly starts to take flack for being transphobic. Then despite years of doing feminist stuff, an army of screechers who are even more left wing than her, even more feminist than her, even more pro trans rights than her, they all start screeching at her that she's a turf a trans exclusionary radical feminist. I'm not exactly sure what a trans exclusionary feminist really is, but I can say this much, every time I see the term it's usually someone very very fucking angry, usually being very very unreasonable and not listening, screeching it at someone else 
on social media. So I'm going to take a wild punt here that it's not meant as a compliment. I guess TERF means you're the wrong type of feminist because you don't include people who aren't women in your master plan, or you don't include women born as men, or only some types of trans people, or not quick enough, or with enough enthusiasm, or you don't bow low enough whilst you're doing it. I don't fucking know. It's not my place to fucking judge what this all means, or whether it's an evil thing to be. If I hire a plumber and he comes around to fix my pipes, I'm grateful. If I found out he only fixes pipes but won't touch central heating, I wouldn't start screeching and getting upset at him for being a heating system exclusionary plumber. I'd just be grateful that at least he fixed the leaky pipes. Well, apparently Helen Lewis is a lifelong devoted feminist, but because she doesn't blindly and unquestionably support every legal aspect of transgender politics, the angry mob wants to string her up from a lamppost because cancel culture is starting to feed on itself these days. So Reset Era got her cancelled, they caught their victim and got the taste of blood in their mouths yet again, and her contribution to the video game is being edited out in a patch. Ubisoft bent the knee issued an apology and is deleting Helen Lewis's contribution to the game. Fucking hypocrites. So yeah, allegedly Ubisoft makes a terrorist simulator, bullies their staff, puts kiddie gambling in video games, has managers drug, choke and sexually assault their employees, uses their HR department to punish accusers, and is currently doing PR with individuals who were busted for allegedly running a bent gambling scam. Those guys, those guys, won't do business with Helen Lewis because she doesn't align with their values. I don't know anything about Helen Lewis, but I'll just say this, if she doesn't align with Ubisoft's values, frankly, she just went up in my estimation. And regardless of her political beliefs, anyone who is prepared to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an intellectual goliath like Jordan Peterson, at the very least, has some balls and deserves some degree of respect. Count Dankula. That's the one. Right, but he did actually, I mean, that... that he that was a joke. I, I... You might not have liked it. I didn't say it was a good joke. I believe that it was camouflaged yep. as a joke and that's what it kind of comes yeah, across. Right, and I well that's that exactly what you would believe if you were inclined to persecute comedians. All this being said, Helen Lewis does admittedly bleat on about the patriarchy, so this is not a hill that I'm planning to die on. So what are 21 kilotons top tips for Watch Dogs Legion? Get on your cargo drone, armed with a spider bot, and go and farm tech for a few hours, then buy all the gadgets. Don't get emotionally invested. Don't buy the microtransactions. Play it on Uplay Game Pass. Don't actually buy the game. No, really. Really, really don't buy this game. It has to be said that I stopped reviewing this game when I finally got to a broken quest that would not let me advance the main storyline. Perhaps there was a way to complete the game without it. Perhaps they will patch it next week. Perhaps I'll win the fucking lottery and go and live on the moon. But instead, I decided it was the perfect place to stop playing. Apart from a rare few set-piece missions, the game is basically a repetitive loop from a small selection of activities. I had done them all many times and now my game was fucking balked and I was stuck. Time to move on. Now this video is drawing to a close, I will acknowledge that this video has been as much about politics as it has been about video games. Not surprising though, really. Legion is all about politics, and there are only about half a dozen activities in the game that you repeat endlessly until you're bleeding from the anus. There isn't a lot to this game. You recruit people, you hack stuff, you sneak around, drop pallets on people's heads at building sites, and then go and buy a pretty dress. So yeah, given all the colouring in book politics in this game, talking about it was frankly inevitable. Watch Dogs Legion is by no means a terrible game, and it has some interesting ideas. It was certainly far less depressing to review than I imagined. I could drop crates on people's heads and wear a dress, so there was that. 
It does, however, suffer from several defining flaws. It's often boring. It's often broken and unfinished. It's often making confused political statements and utilising dull plot lines and even duller characters to do it. It's a shame, really, because it's like the game had real potential that would never be realised whilst it was sticking to Ubisoft's dogmatic game design philosophy and managed by Ubisoft leadership, rushed out of the door unfinished and on a budget, with a story world where the priority brief was try and pretend you're being political but basically be woke and don't offend anyone. I'm sure if I kidnapped all of the developers that worked on this game and dumped them down at another studio with a bigger budget and some completely unfrightened, no fucks given decent writers, this could have potentially been a great game. I will qualify however, I don't blame the writers for how this game turned out. I'm sure like most video game writers, they were brought in late, told not to piss anyone off, offend anyone, be too controversial, you know, like trying to write porn fiction that wouldn't offend your nan. You can't be creative in that environment. I'm sure they did their best within the confines of Ubisoft's bizarro management and design structure. I said structure, but I really meant gulag. Saying all of this, the biggest irony of Watch Dogs Legion was that there were some utterly brilliant moments that I could have enjoyed, but they were wrecked by the game's shit state. I did this one mission where I had to flee an ambush and came bowling out of that place like a bat out of hell, without the time to even consider my options, I just fucking ran, and there in front of me was a boat. I pounded over there, jumped onto the controls and sped away down the canal system like James fucking Bond. You know, a good one, like Sean Connery, god rest his soul. However, just as I was getting fluffed off by this set-piece saccharine coated masterstroke, the shitty game performance kicked in, it couldn't handle the pace of the vehicle and the game started jittering and then micro-freezing and I kept losing control of the vehicle whilst I overcorrected the steering during the freezes and started bashing into the sides, then bashed into the weir, then the janky game physics took over and instead of James fucking Bond. I ended up looking like some drunken tit trying to ride down a water slide on an inflatable ring. Even when this game was being so awesome I was about to be impressed, the systemic structural corporate problems of Ubisoft as an organisation jumped out on me like some kind of video game vampire and still managed to suck the fucking joy out of the moment. Ubisoft now only makes one game, it's a mishmash of The Division, Ghost Recon, Assassin's Creed and Watch Dogs. They might change the location, the historical setting, the character skins and weapons. But it is, let's face it, the same game. It's a third person, fuck around, time sink, semi open world game where you run around, take cover, have a pulse, location skill, you do puzzles, do the same basic four quests, check out echo reconstructions of past events and collect nonsense. Legion is a more inspired version of this, but it is still this. The problem isn't just that Ubisoft only remakes the one game repeatedly, it's that they are doing it increasingly badly, with a decreasing budget, in a death spiral, like a shot up burning World War 1 biplane. Video game technology has moved on and this one trick pony is out of ideas, constantly cutting budgets to save money and is dropping out of the sky at an accelerating speed. Watch Dogs Legion perfectly sums up the state of Ubisoft as a corporation. It's tired, uninspired, boring and made on the cheap. But it could have been great. All this griping being griped, there is something here. I'm not saying it's a good game, I'm certainly not suggesting you buy it, but I would strongly advise anyone interested in doing more than just shooting their way through their virtual video game worlds to at least try this game when it's fully patched, either on Ubor Game Pass or when it's heavily discounted. There is something interesting about this game's core concept that even Ubisoft couldn't stamp out during the development process. I think the best way to illustrate just how far Ubisoft has disappeared up its own arse right now 
was shown to me by Sir Grumpsalot. Ubisoft is a corporation with a track record of structural corporate sexual abuse. They put kiddie gambling in their games. There are pedo caches in all of their full price titles, yet they still showboat about cancelling a feminist for not being feminist enough and in the right way. But still find time to make jokes about having paedophile NPCs in their games. I'm sure some forensic psychologist once noted that serial killers always like to leave clues because deep down unconsciously they want to get caught so they can show off just how much fucked up shit they really got away with. Well now Ubisoft are putting paedophile NPCs in their games for lols so you can recruit them. That's a big red flag right there. But for now, good luck and happy hunting.